When it was opened here in Chicago in 1930, this was the largest building in the world, four million square feet. It is so large, it even has its own zip code. This is the Merchandise Mart. It's still the home of many wholesale businesses, but these days it has a new lease on life as home to business incubators, like this one called 1871. Entrepreneurs who want to start a business gather here early on to work on business plans and look for money. They rent space and facilities in the hope that their entrepreneurial idea will attract people with money, people called venture capitalists. I'm talking about people who are willing to risk lots of their money in order to help others get started. It works like this. One person has a great idea, but no startup money. Another person has startup money, but no great idea. What happens when you put them together? Sometimes they fail, but sometimes they succeed big time. And when they do, we all profit. That cell phone of yours, your computer, and many of the medicines that keep you well, they wouldn't have been invented if it hadn't been that a few people were willing to take a chance on a new idea and to place their personal fortunes at risk. And don't forget, along the way, the investments in these companies created lots of jobs and helped grow our American economy. Politicians try to create jobs with government programs. They make investments with taxpayers' money, but suffer no consequences if those investments go south and jobs disappear. The people you're about to meet invested their own money in what they thought was a winning idea. And the risk of failure hung over every investment. So watch and judge for yourself. Shouldn't we encourage our private inventors and the investors who take all the risk? The risks were just enormous. They came to me with no business plan. Willing to risk everything. You have to be a street fighter. Thousand million dollars. Billion dollars. Intel. Apple. Genentech. Cisco. Good markets. Green. Companies. Rolling. Companies. Guys. Limit. The rest is history. I was in my laboratory, probably talking to students. Here's a call, comes out of the blue. This young guy wanted to know if the technology was ready to be commercialized. Then he said the magic word. He says, I have access to some money that would allow us to get started. And I said, okay. I said, where does the money originate? And he said, I'm a junior member at a uh, venture capital firm. I went to look up what venture capital meant. I had never heard of it before. I don't know how to write a business plan. I can only tell you how we read them. And we start at the back, and if the numbers are big, we look at the front to see what kind of business it is. <laughs> you have to look at the way conventional wisdom works and abandon it. No one has ever accused me of underestimating <laughs> myself. Jobs and Wozniak came up to see me. Steve Jobs was so visionary and so bright. Uh, I had to fire him, though. Back in the spring of 1957, Arthur Rock was just a junior banker on Wall Street. But then one day, an unsolicited letter arrived at the office. The letter was unusual, and no one else at his brokerage firm knew what to do with it. It was a cry for help, and it would forever change the trajectory of Arthur Rock's life. You gotta be lucky. Everybody's gonna be lucky at some time or another. The thing I'd say is I was lucky to be lucky early. <laughs> the letter on Arthur Rock's desk had come from eight engineers in California a group of brilliant young men who would soon become known as the Traitorous Eight. We were young guys, a bunch of young engineers and 
and the scientists mostly, working together to Shockley Semiconductor. Things had deteriorated at Shockley Lab. He was a very difficult person to work with, and a group of us started considering the possibility at least of leaving. A group feeling arose to the effect that rather than leave one by one, we believe we are much more valuable to an employer as a group. These were, by their resumes, very superior people. And I thought, well, gee, maybe there's something here, something more valuable than just to be an employee. That's something that Arthur saw inspired him to step out of his ordinary role as a Wall Street banker. Arthur Rock had to get creative about finding capital for the Traders 8. In fact, we sat down with the Wall Street Journal looking for companies to ask to invest in these eight fellas in forming a new company. I think we had 35 companies. All of them said no, no. The attempt to start a new company might have ended then and there, with the Traders 8 returning to their job search and Arthur Rock admitting defeat. But then, Arthur received one last lead. We were pretty much at wit's end, and somebody suggested that I see uh, Sherman Fairchild. Sherman Fairchild was an entrepreneur himself and also a very wealthy man. He right away saw the possibilities and decided that Fairchild Cameron Instrument would invest the million and a half dollars we were looking for. With the 1.5 million Arthur raised, the Traders 8 started Fairchild Semiconductor in Mountain View, California, a sleepy rural town 35 miles south of San Francisco. Fairchild was the first company to manufacture the sophisticated silicon chips that would power computers rockets and spacecraft, paving the way for the high-tech age. In time, the fruit orchards surrounding Fairchild would give way to electronics companies, and the area would become famous as the Silicon Valley. When I started in the venture business, it never occurred to me that we would have multiple funds that would easily exceed a billion dollars. In 1972, Don Valentine decided to trade on his connections in the semiconductor industry and went in search of capital to start a venture fund. Rebuffed by Wall Street, Don Valentine found a mentor in a Southern California mutual fund manager who staked the money for Don's first venture fund. I'm not interested in entrepreneurs who will do it our way. I'm interested in entrepreneurs who have a vision of doing something consequential, preferably that becomes big. For most people, there's something intimidating about the idea of interacting with a computer, but that is what's happening here. Atari had one of Silicon Valley's absolutely larger-than-life personalities leading it, Nolan K. Bushnell. Bushnell was a young engineer working for game manufacturer Nutting Associates when he decided to strike out on his own in 1972. I said, you know, I can run a company and I won't make any of the same mistakes these idiots are doing. The first game Atari designed was Pong. Nolan took a prototype of the game, strapped it to his back, and placed it in a bar in Sunnyvale, California. By the next morning, customers were lined up outside, clamoring for a chance to play. We put it on location, earned a lot of money. Production soared, and there seemed to be an insatiable appetite for the coin-operated game. From the outside, Atari looked like a wildly successful company, producing an endless stream of popular games. But there was one key problem. The company was started with $250, and so we never had any money. In 1974, Atari was flirting with bankruptcy and desperately needed financial help. But Nolan found the traditional channels off-limits. 
banks lend on assets. So do you have a house? I'll give you a mortgage. Do you have a car? I'll, I'll give you a loan on your car. Nolan had no basis for a bank to be comfortable. Don might have passed on Atari had Nolan not shown him a surprising new product in development. Home Pong. Atari's engineers had discovered they could get the entire Pong game down to the size of a shoebox. At the time, playing video games at home was a revolutionary concept. We showed Don our plans for the home games. He finally decided there was a business there. Fabulous product, giant market. He used to say, you know, the coin up business, you think it's big? He says, you ain't seen nothing. Huge. Once we decided to finance Atari, it was a matter of trying to figure out who else would invest in it. One of our investors was a very big shareholder of Sears, and they facilitated the introduction to the buyer at Sears who would buy a product like this. I think he was charmed by Nolan and found this experiment might be fun. Everybody's talking about a new way of shopping. Do you want to lose your mind? Home Pong hit the shelves just in time for the 1975 Christmas season. And of course, the rest is history. At the time we started Genentech, there was no such thing as genetic engineering. And to take the idea of commercializing gene splicing, the risks were just enormous. I said, well, you know, what if God or Darwin won't let us make a new life form? It came out of the blue for me. I had not been thinking about starting a company. I thought I was going to uh, die at the lab bench with a pipette in my mouth, but uh, Bob called and he wanted to know if the technology was ready to be commercialized. Bob Swanson, I think, was the most prescient individual I've ever met. Once he understood what the potential technology was in genetic engineering, he got the whole picture way ahead of anybody else. And he called Professor Boyer at the University of California. Boyer said, I'll give you five minutes. And it turned into, you know, many hours. In those days, funding for research was uh, difficult. Over the next couple of weeks, Swanson persuaded Boyer to take the idea of gene splicing into a, some sort of a commercial operation. So we go into one of the Embarcadero Towers and we go up to the top floor and you can look out over the world. It was something like out of a movie and I had a holy smoke. Here was this rich guy, you know, and talking to us about science and funding science. I paid attention. They wanted to raise um, about $3 million to build the factory, hire the people, and then see if it would work. But underlying it all was the, the tremendous risk factor of, you know, would it be possible? It was pure research. You know, and everybody knows that venture capitalists shouldn't openly fund pure research. So my idea in everything has always been to try to put the risk up front and get rid of the risk as fast as you possibly can. We changed the business plan. I persuaded them to subcontract the experiment to two different institutions. By subcontracting, Tom Perkins eliminated the need to buy equipment, 
build a lab, and hire staff. The estimated $3 million startup costs were reduced to just $250,000. Kleiner Perkins put up the money, and Genentech was in business. It was Bob Swanson and a checkbook sitting in our office here. That was Genentech. <laughs> Boyer and Swanson set out to create human insulin. But to test their concept, they began with a less complex hormone. City of Hope Medical Center in Los Angeles would try to engineer a gene for that hormone. Then UC San Francisco would splice that gene into bacteria to produce the hormone in significant amounts. After a very long time, City of Hope succeeded in making the gene and then we transported the gene. Bob had it in his pocket <laughs> up to University of California, and her boyer inserted it into the bacterial host. Then it worked. <laughs> so we had our breakthrough. That was the first time in history that uh, mankind had ever made an artificial, uh, well, let's just say an artificial bacteria. Most doctors agree that genetic engineering will be the source of most drugs in the next decade. As scientists look ahead, they see a myriad of products, new vaccines. We haven't scratched the surface yet in terms of uh, new hormones and molecules that the body produces itself to keep itself healthy. You know, it wasn't my goal to start an industry. You know, my goal was to make sure the science got translated into an endeavor that would be useful to people. In all the things I've done, I think I'm most proud of Genentech because it, uh, well, it's saved hundreds of thousands of people's lives. Well, isn't it great if you can make money and change the world for the better at the same time? We need guys with new ideas about how to do things. All these ideas. You've got to get to the frontier. Do something. Build a company. The entrepreneurial spirit. The entrepreneurial spirit. Entrepreneurship. Making the world go round. Hardworking, visionary. Change the way people work. Educate their kids. And you can do it.